It's the SARC is scheduled for November slash December. It's so they haven't they haven't finalized the dates on that yet. Um, so, so, so probably. And but then it will go through right. So we will go through an addendum if we come up with new reference points that are accepted by peer review. It'll go through the addendum process and it will be put into uh, an FMP. There was a question about whether the section could accelerate the timing of the 2013 SARC and have the review completed earlier. I don't know. Um, the, this is again, this is the SARC is, is the federal review process. So we'll be sort of piggybacking on the federal review. They, they cough up the money for the independent experts. I know they're, they're putting a lot of high profile species through this year and next year as well. I don't know what our chances would be of, of moving it up so that we could use it for management next year so I mean it's right it's we probably we do need um, well I'm thinking that we could probably help accelerate the process if it work I mean, it just, we need the time to get the young to develop that's something different so I mean yeah it's I mean we could I think we could the that northern shrimp TC could sit down and talk with young about what is you know, a reasonable acceleration. Like is summer that we can't get it on the schedule for summer, but could we do, you know, an October review as opposed to a November review? I don't know. And I don't know what the NRC would be. Um, I'm just wondering if you could, if the scheduled date is for November, December, is it possible to put around in the, in the discussions this year for next year to move the season to start in January, like we've been wanting to do anyway, and allow that information to I mean, it would essentially be up to the section. To sure. But I mean, to, to, yeah, start the conversation on that within the section. I mean, they have the, they have the ability to do that currently. Um, so I'm not, I guess I don't fully understand your question other than they literally could exercise the right to just have the season start in January. So they can wait for the new stock assessment. Yes. Um, now, one other thing is that um, our process is such that it, um, new reference points go through the addendum, okay. pro the addendum process, um, which I think I think it literally it, it would take some time. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a thirty day well, it's a thirty day comment period to be used, and um, it would be a meeting to initiate and a meeting to finalize. Um, so it, it can be fast tracked, but there is some process um, time frame that's involved in that. Okay. And, that, and, that, and that what the peer, re right. peer review says, I mean, this may be, if they kick this to the curb, this may be a moot point. But um, I mean, I think it's something that the section could, should keep in mind, and I think the Northern Trip Committee will keep in mind in terms of what's feasible for an earlier date and what we can do to make sure the section. Gets, or maybe if the NRCC can push the. Had it start in November instead of December. That was my question to Katie because the NRCC is in the middle of There certainly is a budget to get it externally reviewed. We have to go through the, the SARC process. Um, I don't know how many times. So, so the earliest date then is 2014. Right. Unless so, somehow the process would, could be fast tracked enough. Yeah, but you know, so it goes through the end of the process. It does the process. Right. Then the process, so 2014. Mm -hmm. So that's what, seven years after the last SARC and their recommendations. 2007 was the last SARC. Right. I count that right. But the last SARC in 2007, we didn't make it until the end of the year. It's still being used. It's I can't remember if it was a, it was a December start, wasn't it? I think so, yeah. So, right. So it's, the time frame is similar in, in the sense that the review comes in December and we're trying to do the season. Right, no, I know the time of the start, but I'm saying the time anything can be, anything can come, uh, reasonably can come out of it as far as management goes and how it affects the yeah. industry. So but the timing is difficult exactly. because you have the SARC review about the same time. 
so um, I guess we can sort of jump into sort of our future work, and then I think we can we actually have the um, executive summary from the last peer review, so we can go over their research recommendations and what we've done sort of to address those. So things that we want to do um, for this next benchmark. So obviously natural mortality. Um, we want to go over literature and the shrimp life history to try and determine the best value, um, including considering sort of stage specific M. I think what um, Ann and Maggie were talking about earlier is we, when we measured, when we actually went out and tried to measure M during a period when the fishery was not active, we came up with this point with this low value, this 0 0.17, 0 0.25. And so, but that's only tracking sort of those fishable middle stages. So probably biologically what's happening is the young animals before they recruit to the fishery have a really high mortality. And then the older females after they spawn have a very high mortality. So you have this very short lifespan, but during the time that we're seeing them in the fishery when we were measuring M, it could be lower. So having sort of a stage specific M I think would help us, uh, would help improve the model. As well as going back and looking at some of this predation data, um, especially from the Jason Link's work, I think we want to go back to sort of, you know, re-examine some of the inputs to that they've worked on and try to come up with some estimates of predation or at least relative impacts of predation when we're considering um, natural mortality. Um, as well as life history, um, sort of improve the growth model. Crustaceans have a very, because they molt as opposed to just growing continuously, um, we need sort of a, we want to try to find a growth model that can handle that um, as we move them through time. With all your other priorities, what's the timeline on this future work? So these are all things we are doing for the 2013 benchmark. I can't guarantee that we will check all of them off our list perfectly, but these are our goals for the 2013 benchmark. So I think if we're talking November versus December, November is reasonable. If we're talking November versus June, June is not reasonable. So although, of course, we will I double check with Young on that question. For the next benchmark, we also want to improve the CSA model uh, to allow multiple indices and to incorporate uncertainty in the survey and the catch data better so that we have better estimates of how confident we are in the final output. And this work is actually already um, well underway at the Northeast Fishery Science Center. Uh, we use the toolbox version of the CSA model, and they are working to incorporate these changes. Um, as we speak, we're sort of beta testing that now. Um, but that obviously needs a good vetting through peer review. Um, and in addition to the CSA, we also want to develop a length or a stage-based model. And Yong Chen from the University of Maine is actually leading this work. He is the one who led the development of the current length-based model that's used for lobster. Um, and the NSTC is supporting him through with um, sort of the data needs and the um, and model structure questions, but they're working on sort of taking the lead on this. So when we come to, to peer review, we will have multiple options for a preferred for a potential model going forward. And that work is being funded directly by Maine DMR. And then again, we want to come back and explore these alternative management benchmarks. So the current historical proxy is based sort of on empirical observations. And obviously there's some error around those observations, but it is based on the history of the fishery. We want to develop model-based alternatives to potentially maximize productivity, but still keeping in mind kind of the, the history of the fishery and allowing sort of these, these older lands to provide sort of a, a gut check on, on what's reasonable um, biologically into the fishery. So um, we didn't talk about all of the potential <coughs> options. There's also, I mean, we can do sort of MSY proxies from a, from a age structure or stage structure model. That would also, um, I think, provide insight. But that's sort of the suite of options that we want and tend to have completed for the peer bench review, <laughs> excuse me, peer review benchmark in 2013. Questions on future work? There was a question about whether we're doing anything new with the survey data in the future. Um, we are, no, we are, sorry, going back to, um, definitely going back to the surveys to try and um, work on environmental covariates, um, sort of vetting some of the survey data and some of the recommendations that came out in the last peer review. Um, <clears throat> we're also going to um, look at using a fishery deep, or looking at the fishery dependency PUE, see if we can standardize that in a way that's meaningful. Uh, I think we've talked about some of the, the risks of it, but um, 
we'd like to take another look at that and see if there's a way we can control for some of those effort variables. What did you mean about the survey? Well, I think in the, uh, was the, in the uh, recommendations of the last SAR, wasn't there issues about looking at survey data, how it's collected? Uh, yes, so here. Distribution. Yes. So this is from the um, peer review report summary. Um, and we can go through, um, so basically right now we can just go through sort of their recommendations and what we've done to address them. So obviously we've got um, <clears throat> the question of data collection. Um, so <clears throat> data collection on discard rates in the northern shrimp fishery. Um, we've started looking at uh, collecting data on discards rates or we can I believe have we, we have better data. We have better data. Um, so we're we're definitely looking into this. Um, I don't know if we'll have a complete discard history by the next assessment, but I think we'll have a little bit of better handle on on um, some of those rates. Increased sampling of commercial catches um, and making sure we allocate them better among ports and among port over time. We're definitely then um, improving the port sampling and the collecting um, in recent years on those issues. Research on annual variation at size, at age, um, we are definitely, we'll be definitely doing that for the next assessment, trying to look and see if we are seeing, I mean, we know we do see changes at least in, in um, size at stage uh, from year to year. Um, and I think we'll, hopefully we can get a better handle on, on those differences. Yeah. There was a question about what it would mean if there were a lot of shrimp found with new sampling in down east Maine? Well, it would depend It would depend on sort of, I guess, on what segment of the population we're looking at when we go down there. So if there's, if it turns out there's a big population there, then the question becomes, is that population behaving the same way that the larger part that we're actually sampling is? Or is it doing something different, something separate? If it's something separate, that has big implications for how we're managing the species. But if it's behaving sort of the same way that the population in the areas that we've already sampled is behaving, so we're seeing sort of the same age classes and it goes up, they sort of go up and down together, it won't have as much of an impact on the overall assessment because again, it's, it's relative trends. So that while our, the total number of shrimp that we've sampled may have increased, the, the overall trend won't have it won't be affecting the overall trend. But that would suggest that there would be a larger biomass than what you're seeing. It, the, it doesn't come from, the, the, the total estimates of biomass don't come from the survey, it comes from landings. So landings are essentially what we use to scale. So the, nobody's fishing. So if nobody's, Down well. East. So. If, and, and another question that in race arises too, that I mentioned it, the, the Maggie, I mean, the last couple of years that we did shut down, we were fishing on, I mean, almost all entirely five year class with the vast majority of age level. And I mean, isn't there some way? I mean, it's, it's a shame, it's my understanding that they, after the five year class, they don't die. I mean, you're not, does that hurt the population? Why can't we, if, if we're going to increase what's that? And keep, keep a, a handle on, on what we're catching. I mean, why penalize us for? They're doing the right thing and not fishing and doing our shrimp and we get large shrimp which is going on dying. Is there some way that you can I should jump in and I guess and, and stop the perception that down east they only catch five year old females. Um, they caught predominantly four year old females this past winter, but they did catch more fives than the western part of the coast was seeing. That has an implication to um, when we calculate what the average number of shrimp, the average size of a shrimp. Uh, if the average size of the shrimp is bigger, that means you're catching fewer individuals and your F rates are lower. So you should be able to catch more if you're catching bigger shrimp. Um, so at that point, does Down East Maine ask for a, a separate zone? Possibly. I mean, do we split the state right down the middle? Because I, mean, I mean, obviously the way things are being handled in, in Western part of the state is, is completely different from what we're seeing in the eastern part of the state. I mean, we're opening volcano worms here. I mean, it's, 
I mean, yeah. There's no, but it's, good, it's good, down, good question. There's not that many fishermen down there, which is, you know, decisions that are being made here is affecting all of us. But Like I said earlier, if you have a separate stock, if your animals are are separate and they don't behave the way the animals do the rest of you are, then, yeah, you should definitely have a separate management area. But that's not going to happen because the state's broke. I mean, we need more information. I mean, yeah, basically. Yeah. So, I mean, I, it's like, I hate to say this, but it's expensive to do management. It's a wicked catch-22 because you don't have a big fishery, so you know, there's politically you're not strong, and there's the money right. to do a separate survey of your area, so you continue to be a part of that. And I think we, and you know, as we go forward, we'll use the available survey, the inshore survey, as well as the, the summer survey to try and get a better handle on whether we're really seeing a separate population, a separate dynamic, or can, or is it just we're fishing on what, what was perceived to be not there anymore, and, and we're get, just getting better data on what's actually out so there. So it could be perceived that, I mean, where we start later, <coughs> down these we traditionally start in the middle of September, in the middle of July. So, but I mean, when we're starting later in the season, I mean, we're not catching the next season. We're staying away from the juveniles. So, I mean, maybe the fishing practices ought to be modeled around what we're doing. Well, that's an option yeah, in so the point. current that's addendum. That's what Karen and I was talking about. So, in the current addendum, there's the flexibility and options to allocate this, what we've used as uh, a Gulf of Maine quota, by state or by so if it did go down the allocation by state, for example, then it's within Maine's purview to do some, what I guess would be considered micromanaging of their specific quota to different regions. So the flexibility does exist if you're allocating and splitting up the quota to the states. So there is, that's a document that's currently up for comment and something that you can get feedback on if that is of interest to you. So that there is some management options that are being developed that could potentially address the concern from the group. Yeah. Oh, and it'll be addressed at our November 9th meeting, which I mentioned at the beginning of this. So um, that's when they'll finalize that addendum. But the, the comment period actually closes tomorrow. So. If, uh, if there were a group of troopers that were getting short of the stick, Totally off the wall for them to take these guys on the survey and their boat to save the state money, but it might help them in the end. Well, the other thing that um, this plan considers, I, guess, I think that this would apply to your question, is that um, there's some flexibility for what is a research set aside. Um, and that's that's literally the intent of that set aside is to answer some of the industry's concerns, um, something that would help the technical committee understand this resource better. Um, and the industry obviously understands the resource the best. So that's why the research set aside is designed for specifically projects like that. The thing is, you couldn't just sample in that area, those new areas without sampling. Yeah. Um, are you aware of the uh, substantial uh, turf fishing that's taking place in uh, the Bay of Fundy, uh, Cam and Ann, Cam and Bella area from 2002? <coughs> I mean, sorry, 2009, 2010? I've heard people tell us that there has been sporadically a small Bay of Fundy fishery. Well, there's, there's, it's not very big because there were a few boats participating, but the boats that were participating were catching huge numbers of shrimp. So were they particular years, you said? 2010, 2009, some 2008. I don't, think, I don't think last year. I don't have any information last year. I just got to get out more. I mean, 
Yeah, I wanted to, that, that was my next question. I was going to say, if you let us, if we could have gone on the fishermen, east of Morocco could have gone a month longer last year, we would have found out an awful lot. Because there was more shrimp in the water in the eastern part of the state than I've ever seen. That's pretty interesting. And they were everywhere. And you can imagine, if you just think about it, the state, what there is from Morocco to Eastport, and all that shrimp is gone in. Where they're at. It is nothing but a rock pile, so you can't throw it everywhere. I mean, there's a lot of untouched water. It's, it's just it's too bad that it's not being used. This is why I think the big ones that are in there. We get we get small ones out on the 50 fathom curve. But when they get in, get up over the rocks and whatever, get in, they seem to be all live shrimp. I've never seen a gear down there of small shrimp. Never. When the when the bodies of them there, and I've seen like them come in one little bunch first, and then the second bunch comes in, and I've also seen them in November, and later they're ready. But no, that November, December, or even December month should be left alone, period, to where we are, because they're always buried with age, usually. I have seen them on a year, November comes in, and goes. So. But they've always been large. And we never kept record because we had to sell them down there. And I talked to Spencer earlier. When the big boom down there was going on, uh, we don't know what happened to There was a factory in Machias that was buying the shrimp from Rockland East. And he says there were two or three places down there that was buying. And they had to be because everything was going east. And a lot of shrimp. In the town started to, we had. 17 boats fishing out of there. So, and they had more east of us. So, there's a, there's, there's a lot of shrimp from somewhere down there. Other questions for the company? We can come back to um, finish going uh, through right. the, um, the research recommendations. I mean, to a certain extent, it's kind of what we just covered in future work. But um, so, annual variation size of age, we're absolutely working on that. Um, the possibility of using a more detailed assessment model. This is, we've actually contracted out with Young Chen to develop, like you said, a length or a stage-based model that's a more sophisticated model, um, <clears throat> similar to, but obviously uh, not exactly the same as what they're using for lobsters. So to get a better handle on um, not just two stages of recruits and post-recruits, which is what the CSA handles, but more detailed information on males, female one, female two, the immatures, and get a better handle on how the population is behaving. So that's definitely on the table that is being done. Um, so environmental effects on the survey indices, on stock and recruitment, on, and on surplus production. Um, stock and recruitment is actually easy and is actually just recently published work that she's been doing on the relationship between the environment, between stock and recruitment. And basically, I mean, there is a relationship between stock size and recruitment. So you absolutely see low stock sizes gives you low recruitment, higher stock sizes give you higher recruitment. But you also see an effect of temperature, that warm years are bad for recruitment. <clears throat> so trying to find that balance and what that's going to be in the future, I think, is a really important part of both understanding what's going on now and also understanding what the productivity of the stock will be in the future. So these, so that's definitely something we're interested in pursuing further. Um, and likewise on the surplus production, can we, can we bring environmental information into the surplus production model as sort of another way of looking at the stock? And as well as looking at um, spatial depth or temperature influences on survey catchability. Um, so I think it was probably one of the, may have been one of the research recommendations that you're talking about. Um, but in terms of going back and understanding what's driving these, uh, the survey values in addition to abundance. Um, number three is kind of a technical one. The CSA um, trying to understand the ratio of catchabilities for these. Um, so how catchable are the young shrimp compared to the old shrimp and getting a better handle on that number and what the sensitivity of that is, which is um, definitely something we'll be working on. Um, as well as, like I said, we want to address the impact of predation on natural mortality, which is one of their recommendations. And as well as <clears throat> understanding uh, what the actual best value of M is. Um, and 
they pointed out that, you know, changing your value of M will change your reference points. And that's another thing that we have to consider. Um, the target and threshold reference points at the time of the assessment were actually the same. So your target was your threshold. We've since, at the base, on the recommendation of the peer review panel, built in a buffer between the target and the threshold so that when you try to attain this target and kind of overshoot it, you don't go into overfishing territory. Ideally, you should sort of um, at least hit the threshold in that case. So this is actually one we've implemented already. So what I want to point out about these research recommendations is that acceptance of the peer review report was, or the peer review of this model was not conditional on these um, research recommendations. They accepted the model as it was presented to them um, and just they feel these things would improve it and we agree and we'll definitely work on those but as it was presented it was acceptable for management use. So these things the, and these are pretty major things that we can't just that we can't pull off in a year or two and that we can't just stick into the model and run with it. They're, they represent in some cases major model changes and major data input changes. So they need to go through a benchmark process to be examined and vetted before they go into management use, which is what we will be doing for the 2013 benchmark. And we have already started. Yes, exactly right. None of the, right, we're like, it's not like we're, we're waiting till 2013. We've actually started work on a lot of this. Um, it'll be completed for the 2013 benchmark. Uh, well, <laughs> we're aiming to complete for the 2013. What's the process of uh, prioritizing these and uh, making sure these are done and uh, tracking it on a timeline? Is that done by the technical committee? Does the section have any input to that? Or who, who is responsible for pursuing these recommendations? The technical committee. I think if the section had um, serious concerns and they had a prioritization they could definitely give us input. We would obviously want to be able to respond to that and talk about um, what's actually feasible in terms of timeline, what needs more money, what we need more technical support for, and these kinds of issues. So it's, um, we've been, I think, we've prioritized based on personnel availability, data availability, as well as time and money availability in terms of, of, what's, of when we start these and when and where we see them fitting into the overall timeline of the, of the benchmark process. And also what we think. Yes, as well as, exactly. So um, the so I think, you know, we would, it's, it's the same as with the surveys, you know, there's, from, just from the, from the data side, there's a ton of stuff we want to know and we want to get data for, but we don't have the time or money to get it. And from the model side, I think there's a ton of stuff that we want to do and develop even further, and we prioritize it down into Sort of this list based on um, what we think is most important and what the peer review panel recommended is most important and what input we've gotten from the section or from stakeholders in terms of what people are concerned about. I think I'd like to make a suggestion on the, uh, after the next step of 2013 that uh, recommendations coming out of this, the uh, SARC that uh, the table committee prioritize those, comment on them, and give us a timeline, or give the industry a timeline of whether if it are going to be initiated, pursued, and when they might be completed. Um, this last time it was. I mean, it's. Be, you know, it almost sounds to me almost flippant about the recommendations. You know, great, we passed it, but. I mean, too, and I certainly don't want to don't want to appear flippant about it. I think to a certain extent we are limited by the process that that once they've accepted this model, and it's the best available science. We can't just go in and build a completely new model on top of it and say, we've addressed your concerns, thumbs up, let's go forward with this. And well, I think it, I recognize that and, and you know, let people know about how you, you know, instead of just nothing. So in, the, and in that case, um, and I mean, though, that's a good, we need, you know, we certainly are concerned about outreach and communication with, with everybody involved, not just the sector and the managers, but with everybody. So, um, so I you're think, saying let people know as things are somewhere that we can look and find Well, after the science. process, you get your recommendations. I mean, that right. most industries, you say, okay, let's prioritize those. This is what we can do. This is what we can't do. This is our limitation. Based on those limitations, you might be able to get something to work that you couldn't get to work because people know about it. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, addressing them, uh, putting them up on the table, and, and uh, getting them better and working them out. Right. So, I mean, uh, we've so, done that process, but we haven't communicated what we've been doing. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think it would be very helpful in this next one that that, that be done and 
reasonable timeline established, then it's, you know, the section can, can look at that and do that. And if they can prioritize different, they may put that in. Industry may be able to put some input in. Or, you know, uh, Spencer, I think we can call it part of terms of reference. I mean, we always write our terms of reference for the stock assessment. We always do have one about, you know, research recommendations, but I think including exactly. So lay out, not just, you know, what do we want to do? What's our, what's our hopes and dreams, but also, you know, what's reasonable for the next benchmark? What kind of a timeline are we looking for for that development? Um, and that's, that's definitely easy. And I think it's, you're right. It should be something we spread, share more widely than um, we currently do. I think that was the, and um, Yes, that's the end of the research recommendations from the last reading. That completes all of our sections. Are there any other questions, I guess, about anything involving Northern Shrek and Sun? Maggie, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that missing year class, the one and a, one and a half year old trim, the missing signal from 2011, so much else, sure. and the ramifications for the model for your assumptions of the trial survey. So, so what kind of yeah. Okay, so here's the 2011 survey results that I presented last fall. And um, in general, we, we look at around 15 millimeters or a little bit bigger. We expect to see a pile here, and those are the new shrimp that we haven't seen before. They're, we think they're about a year and a half old. So, you know, in the old nine, survey, we're looking at the 08 year class here. Uh, in the 2010 survey, we're looking at the 09 year class. And in the 2011 survey, we just didn't see much in that area, right about here. Um, we think that these two year classes grew to here. Um, but where we usually expect to see a strong, you know, we hope to see a new year class, we just didn't see much that year. And that was substantiated by the inshore trial survey, they didn't see it either. Uh, so the implications for the model are not huge. Um, the model, as Anne described, kind of ignores the small shrimp because they're generally not fished upon. So the model um, kind of filters them out and it, it applies a uh, fishery selectivity to it. It recognizes that the fishery doesn't select these shrimp. And so the model will just work off of the bigger stuff. So that didn't really have much of an implication for the model for the assessment. We do keep it in the mind, back of our minds, though, because that's going to impact us in the future as that missing year class continues to be missing throughout its life. Um, you we present it to the, to the managers and say, look, we've got a missing year class. We can put that in the back of the head. We've had missing year classes before. It's not a, doesn't mean the sky's falling. Um, if you get a couple missing in a row, that's not good. We've had that happen in like in year 98 and 97 year classes. Mm -hmm. That did have an impact um, in the early 2000s. You know, the assessment was just pretty poor. I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, that's that, that. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. I'm going to ask you one great question. Oh, good. Just one? The shrimp. You know, shrimp grows faster in warm water. Yeah, they do. They should. Uh, like other crustaceans, like lobsters, you know, we're seeing faster growth. Or water and up to a point you would expect you would in shrimp also. There's certainly an upper limit where they are not as active. Oh, I'm not sure on the shrimp on the walk through. I'm pretty sure about the walk through. I think it's like the five years or seven years where we live in Maine, at least in the state, the Boston area, it's five years for a walk through to get the size, sellable size, from seven to one. I think I'm right on that. I don't know, I, I don't know much about Well, anyway, I was concerned right. about. These temperatures that we've got uh, this, this, this year, what's going to happen? You know, what we're going to see you know, uh, grow size and whatever. You know, I've never seen a year. I've never seen the water, seawater, 62 degrees. All right. That's not good for the survival of the youngest shrimp. For some reason, Anne's done quite a bit of work on this, and I showed this last November when you have unusually high sea surface temperatures in the spring uh, that seems to be correlated with very poor recruitment from the year class that's born in the spring. Um, so yeah, the last three counties 
these past times, we've had three in a row that were record-breaking uh, spring surface weather temperatures. So is it is it the survival rate with the temperature, or is it actual? Could it could it be pushing the shrimp in a different migration? Well, um, we don't really know what the mechanism is. What we're, what we're looking at is the survival rates of each year class and correlating that with temperature and with spawning stock size. And it turns out that, as um, Katie mentioned, that spawning stock size affects the, the number of babies, but also the temperature. And but we don't. And the temperature effect makes sense. You know, it's a, a, a boreal species that's at the southern limit of its distribution. So you would expect that warmer temperatures would lead to poorer survival. But if you compare the temperatures that we see in the Gulf of Maine, even now, with laboratory studies that have been done looking at temperature effects on, on growth of larvae, they actually ought to be growing and surviving better at these temperatures, even though they, it's, you know, it seems counterintuitive. But we're not seeing that. So it's not clear whether, it seems like maybe it's not a direct physiological effect on the, on the larvae, but one of the things I've kind of looked at over the years, and that chance to really look at this again lately, but is that it may have something to do with temperature effects on the timing of the hatch, you know, because that is happening earlier now. I, have you guys noticed that? So, you know, the evolution has made it so that, that the larvae hatch at the same time their food are available, otherwise the larvae die. But, if, you know, the early larvae are uh, feeding on phytoplankton and the diatoms and so forth. The timing of that is more dependent on the light than on the temperature. So the shrimp are cued to temperature and the diatoms are cued to light, so they can get a real mismatch there if things really change a lot. So I've been sort of looking at that, but um, I mean, that's one possibility. You know, there could be lots of other things too. So, I mean, push, push, push it easy to me again, but I mean, still, how is the data? That would suggest that what Dick was saying, what went on uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, um, there was a lot of fishing from down this way, not home fish. And they wouldn't have gone up there if there was shrimp here. So, I mean, could whatever may be going on now, I mean, obviously we're seeing more shrimp than what we've seen in 40 years, could the same thing be happening over here? I mean, it's the same things reoccurring in Western Maine that happened 50 years ago? I don't know. It's a really interesting question. And I have to say that, you know, looking at the temperature records for, like, the temperature that's been taken at Blue Bay Harbor since 1905, if you look at those temperature trends, um, they're now approaching the levels they were at in the 50s when the shrimp basically disappeared, uh -huh. which is pretty interesting. But, and, what, um, I just want to, I spoke to one scientist, I think the first one I ever met 25 years ago, and he liked to talk like Peter at all. <laughs> <laughs> who was that? Dan. I, Dan. I can't tell you who was it was. I can't remember his name, but it was in Bute Harbor, and he was explaining to me We're all very glad. how the current Labrador current goes up into the Penobscot Bay, the only bay on the coast it goes up into. There could be such a thing. I, I'm thinking about that current. Yep. And, that, and the nutrients in that current feed the baby shrimp. Yep. And if the, if the water temperature is right in there, mothers oh, will lay their so eggs. The temperature is not right in that Labrador current. Yeah. Or not, if the current's not there, yeah. they won't lay their eggs. They'll die or whatever. I don't know if they won't lay their eggs, but the larvae might not survive as well. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah actually, there's really interesting, I mean, <laughs> from a scientific point of view, it's really interesting. There's a lot of changes going on in terms of uh, the current inflows into the Gulf of Maine, there's, uh, you know, usually there's a contribution from the Labrador current, and then there's also some um, shelf water that comes in, and they're really different in terms of their temperature and the, the levels of nutrients and the types of nutrients. And there's been a major shift in those inflow currents into the Gulf of Maine in, in recent years. And so what this means, actually, you know, generally the, the eastern Gulf of Maine is warmer, has been past in the Western Gulf. That's why we think we see the shrimp in the Western Gulf primarily. But it, Dave Townsend at University of Maine has uh, recently done a study and it, um, it looks like now that the, the um, Eastern Gulf, the bottom water is actually getting a little colder. Is that what you see as well? Colder. 
Yeah, I, then, I, I so that. and that's because of, you know it relate. Well, they think it relates to that the change in the the sources of inflow to the to the Gulf Wind, and also the um, Arctic water melting, and it changes the salinity. It changes the types of nutrients, which changes the types of phytoplankton that are produced, and there's all kinds of stuff going on. I, I really think that we're in a stage now where things are going to be pretty hard to predict what's going to happen because things are changing. They're just changing. And so the thing is, you know, one of the things I think, and this is sort of, you know, for me, I, I sometimes think, well, what do you do about that in the sense of an assessment? Because, you know, we rely on the history of data that we have to help to inform us as to what might happen next. And we're in this changing time. But I think the one thing that's really great for a shrimp is that there's an annual assessment. So you can look at that data every year. Now, many species don't have it that frequently. And with the ch conditions changing, you, know, you really have to look at each year and see what's going on. So it's really interesting. In fact, I wanted to, when everybody's done, I wanted to ask you guys for what you're, especially the people who had said they were in, had been in the fishery since the 60s. You know, what do you see? What are the big trends that you've seen? What are the big changes? And I'm really interested to hear, you know, your, yes. The most important thing for him, because all we had at the time was the water temperature that we had. But we, well, the only water temperature that I had was coming from Patrick's ledge. Mm -hmm. Every morning at 3.30, I would turn it on and get the water temperature and the wind and whatever. That's right the surface now, temperature? Excuse me? Surface of the water? Surface temperature. And then we got machines with the boat. But what I got for temperature on caches, when the temperature in where I fished dropped to 48 degrees, my lobsters always left the shore. That's when he was in. Oh, but I was at a shrimp. Ah. But anyway, <laughs> I enjoyed it to find out about the current. I didn't know where the current went in the state of Maine, but I found out. Yeah, it's really it's interesting. And the circulation patterns, you know, they enter the Gulf of Maine and they sort of go like this in the northeastern part, and then the other, and they split off as that current line. And you can find our contact information yeah, we're, on the ASNFC website if you guys. After thinking about this, want to ask us more questions right. or get in touch. It's not like we're going into hiding. 